So Brexit and the rise of the far right. There are all kinds of political issues in our society that people disagree about. Rates of tax, how to run the NHS, how to manage with our railway system, whether to have it privately owned, publicly owned, etc. And people disagree, but they don't get violently angry about it. It doesn't have husbands and wives sort of shouting at each other. So the question that I've been asking myself about Brexit is what's different about Brexit? And I tried to keep this presentation very fact-based rather than opinion. And the question I've been asking myself is, why is Brexit associated with the rise of the far right? And we'll see if I can explain it. So I'm going to start by looking at some data about hate crimes and then take a close look at people who supported Brexit to see what makes them different from people who were opposed to Brexit. And then go on to the most difficult question of all, which is what can we do as individuals and groups to try to bring society back together from the level of polarization that it has now? And as individuals, we all have limited power, but we have some power. For a start, we control what we ourselves do and say. I'm a retired tax advisor, and I'm currently the co-chair of the Muslim Jewish Forum of Greater Manchester and a couple of other charitable organizations working in the same kind of space. The Islam and Liberty Network promotes the understanding that Islam is compatible with religious freedom, political freedom, and economic freedom. And the address of my website is there, that's where this presentation will end up, that's where you can find lots of previous writings and presentations that I've done. So first of all, a look at hate crime data. This is from a Home Office published document showing monthly hate crime figures as recorded by the police service nationally. And if you go right back to 2013 to now, there's a small but steady upwards trend in hate crime, if you average out all these sort of individual monthly ups and downs. And that could be a combination of better reporting, better data gathering, it could be a change of attitudes, but it's slow and steady. But what's much more interesting is the way you get peaks and troughs. And this red rectangle focuses on the period of the referendum campaign in 2016. And the first dashed line in that red rectangle is when the referendum campaign started. The second dashed line is voting day. And we see that almost from the very start of the referendum campaign, there was an increase <coughs> in reported hate crime. And it continued to rise after the referendum. And then sort of August of 2016, it started to go back down again. Then quite separately, there were the big rise in 2017 with terrorism being carried out by Muslims in Manchester, London, etc., which we're not going to talk about. So there's a clear correlation between hate crime and the Brexit referendum campaign. But of course, correlation doesn't necessarily prove anything. It may or may not be causation. But it's very... It's worth remembering that the person who murdered MP Joe Cox was specifically motivated by her views on Brexit. He accused her of being a traitor. He believed in Britain first, etc. He fits the full definition of a person who's a terrorist, a person who carries out a crime for political goals. So Brexit supporters. Of course, you can't generalize. Brexit supporters differ. There were 17 million of them and they were not all identical. And I picked two of them on this slide to illustrate the point. Daniel Hannan, a guy I've only met once, I had a long chat with him once at a cocktail party about 10 years ago. Very international person, born in Peru and grew up there. For, uh, I can't remember exactly what age he was when he moved to the UK. He speaks Spanish and French. He's happy about immigration. 
and I would describe him as a liberal internationalist. And frankly, apart from the fact that we disagree on Brexit, most of his politics and my politics are sort of pretty similar. Then we have Mr. Tommy Robinson, who is very anti-Muslim. I'm not libeling him when I say that he's anti-Muslim. And objectively, you would describe him as a white nationalist. He was the founder of the English Defence League. So both of these people are opposed to Brexit, but they're like chalk and cheese. So it's, it's not a case of saying that all Brexit supporters are the same. But what is interesting is how Brexit supporters as a category, on average, and I stress the word on average, are different from people who are opposed to Brexit. I mean, one of the things, as an aside, I find very amusing is this idea that it's all about the battle of the, the elite against the people. Because the reality is that virtually all politics is conducted by elites. People who are anti-Brexit are members of the elite, and I confess to being a fully paid up member of the elite myself. People who are pro-Brexit are members of the elite. Boris Johnson isn't a man of the people, he went to Oxford University. Daniel Hannan is not a man of the people, he's a member of the elite. You have two separate parts of the elite competing politically and seeking support from the population as a whole. So that the first thing to always reject is that messaging of somehow it's them fighting on behalf of the people, fighting for the people against the elite, they are the elite. And this is a classic trope used by populists who justify themselves that they somehow represent the people. They are members of the elite, whether it here, or Marine Le Pen in France, or Orban in Hungary, they are fully paid up members of the elite. And I've been reading some research and the PDF copies of this research are with NIDI. Everybody can have them afterwards by email if they want them or they can get them from me. And this is from the National Centre for Social Research. And they've been doing for decades the British Social Attitude Survey. And they had, in their number 34 survey, they had a chapter on Brexit by Sir John Curtis, the polling expert. You've all seen him on TV, he's the old guy who they bring on to provide real sort of expertise as to what opinion polls are telling us. And it's a, in this case, it's about the difference between people who voted leave and voted remain in the referendum of 2016. And the figures that I'm going to show you and the way that they were published in the British Social Attitude Survey, so I haven't manipulated the figures, this is how they published them. For clarity, they excluded people who didn't vote in the referendum, because this is about how people did vote in the referendum. And they also excluded people who said, I did vote in the referendum, but I can't remember how I voted. Because if you can't remember how they voted, how can you include them in the figures? And this is for the whole of Britain. It's not just England and Wales. It includes Scotland uh, and Wales and England, but not Northern Ireland. First of all, by age. People aged 18 to 24 only 28% of them voted leave and 72% voted remain. And if you go to the opposite end of the age spectrum, 65 plus, it flips around. And of course, there are people in this country between those two ages, but I've deliberately left out the rest of the table because I don't want to drown you in numbers. The rest of the table shows an age gradient. The older you get, the more likely you are to have voted leave. This is the slide that people who support Brexit hate because they accuse people like me, who are pro the European Union, of accusing Brexiteers of being thick and uneducated. 22% of people with a degree voted to leave. That will include Daniel Hannan, it will include Boris Johnson, Michael Gove and all the other members of the campaign because they all got university degrees but 78% of people with a degree voted to remain. People who have no educational qualifications, 72% of them voted to leave. And this is simply a fact. And again, the, the full survey has grades in between of different levels of qualification and how they voted, but I haven't cluttered up the slide with those details. Now, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that 
the percentage of people who have degrees changes with age. I'm 68 and in my cohort when I was 18 about 7% of the population went to university and now it's about 50%. So are these education numbers simply telling us in a different way how people voted because of their age? And the answer to that is no. Education is not a surrogate for age. This table looks at people who have a degree in two separate age ranges. And again, the full survey has the sort of in-between ages as well. So people 18 to 34 with a degree, 80% of them voted to remain. But people over the age of 55, 70% of them still voted to remain, including me. People who had a GCSE or less, even the young ones, very few of them voted to remain, 37%. And that wasn't particularly different from the low voting to remain over 55. So education is a separate variable independent of age as the people's attitudes towards Brexit. This was very interesting from the survey. People's, where they are on something called the authoritarian libertarian scale. So you measure people's authoritarianism, and we'll see in a moment how you measure it, and then you divide them into thirds. The most authoritarian third, the middle third, and the least third. And how do we create that scale? We ask, we ask, them, some, ask them some questions, or we put some statements in front of them, ask them whether they strongly agree, agree, don't really care, disagree or disagree strongly. And these are the questions. And these are all questions designed to tee out where you are on that authoritarianism, libertarianism spectrum. And the impression I get from the survey is that these are relatively standard kinds of questions that get used on a sort of regular basis. And when you do that, again, you find a very interesting dispersion of voting patterns. I don't think you would find the same dispersion of voting patterns if the question was, should the top rate of income tax of 45% be raised or lowered? People who are most authoritarian, 72% of them voted leave. That's the most authoritarian third. The least authoritarian third, only 21% of them voted leave. So something is going on here. And this is data. And another question they asked was about how people see themselves, what they think of as their national identity. And they offered them the following choices. Do you see yourself as English but not British? More English than British, about the same? More British than English? Or British, not English? And I don't really know where I sit myself on this issue, but most of the time, when I'm asked to describe myself, I describe myself as British, because I personally have grown up thinking of English as a sort of ethnic identity rather than a national identity, as opposed to Britain, where I think, whereas at one time, some people might have thought of British as being an ethnic identity. You have to be white to be British. That idea is long gone. And there are people like myself now who happily describe themselves as British. I always wear my Union Jack lapel pin. But I don't really think of them myself as English. If Scotland left, I might start thinking of myself as English, because there wouldn't be Britain anyway. So you ask people this question, and again, you find some very interesting <coughs> answers about how they voted on Brexit. And people who thought of themselves as English but not British, 72% voted leave. If you turn it around, only 38% voted leave. Again, you wouldn't find that kind of dispersion if the question was, what should be the top rate of income tax? So, what do we find? This is, the top bit is hard facts, it's data, it's not something you can argue with. Uh, on average, leave voters were older, less well-educated, more authoritarian, and they prioritize their Englishness. Those are facts. Now the question is, 
How do you interpret those facts? And the way that I interpret those facts is I look at that list of characteristics and I see people who are far more likely to belong to far-right groups. And particularly if you move away from the UK for a moment and look at Europe and look at the attitudes and mindsets of people who support other far-right groups in Europe, for example. Supporters of the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland party in Germany, are much keener on focusing on the idea of Germanness as being white Germanness rather than accepting that people who have a Turkish origin or a Moroccan origin can really be German. Uh, historically, while historically the AFD was founded by people who were intellectuals and anti the Euro, it's become a party that appeals mostly to left behind workers in Eastern Germany with low qualifications. So, given that these characteristics are very similar to those who support the far right in other countries, and in practice, if you look at the UK, if you look at who is in the English Defence League, well, first of all, the English Defence League, the name sort of gives it away. They're not people who think of themselves as British. It's not called the British Defence League, it's called the English Defence League. So I do believe that what's happened is that the Brexit referendum has provided a sort of rallying cry, and the whole issue of Europe has provided a rallying cry for people with certain characteristics, and it's caused them to emphasize and amplify that set of beliefs. Again, people like Daniel Hannan get really angry when you say that Brexit was motivated by xenophobia, because Daniel Hannan is not xenophobic. But they wouldn't have won without a lot of xenophobes, and those xenophobes feel empowered as a consequence. I still remember a television documentary I watched shortly after the referendum, and the camera crew had been obviously working for months with this small village somewhere in England, uh, both before and after film recording people, and there was this old lady. And I have a lot of sympathy for old ladies, because it's hard life. And she came out after the referendum. She was delighted because she felt she had got her country back. But if you could sit her down with a lie detector and get her to tell you the truth, she would feel that she had got her country back from people like me and Sukhbir and Rogers. It's undoubtedly the case that she believes that the only people who really belong in this country are people who are white British. And that is what has driven the rise of the far right. So what can we do about it? And of course, none of us have the ability to do anything directly about what happens over the European issue, although I do my bit by marching. I was at the first, the big Brexit march last October in March. I will be at the march on October the 19th. I give money to pro-European groups. But this, today, we're not here to argue about the rights and wrongs of being in the European Union. We're out here to talk about hate crime. The first and most useful thing you can do, I think, is to encourage people to consume better quality news. But, you know, as somebody who has subscriptions to just about every electronic newspaper going, because I'm retired, I've got plenty of time to read, I drown in high quality journalism. But there are people around who don't read any newspapers at all, who get their news, not even from reading the free bits of newspapers you can get on the internet, like The Guardian is completely free, but from what other people tell them and share with them. And of course, they have no way of distinguishing whether what they're being told is true or false. You know, Hillary Clinton is being paid by the Russians to destroy the American in the nation, for example. Whereas every newspaper, even newspapers like The Sun, which frankly I don't think much of, I, I see The Sun quite regularly. When I'm, every so often I go to BBC Radio Manchester to do a thought for the week and I do the newspaper review for that day. And the great thing about doing that is I get to look through all the Sunday newspapers, not just the Sunday Times and the Telegraph and the Observer that are the sort of interesting ones, but I'd get to turn the pages of The Sun, The Mirror, The the Express, the works. And all newspapers 
have standards, even the sun. Quality newspapers have higher standards. The other thing which does apply to people in this room quite strongly, and I would recommend it, is whatever your political views, try to consume some journalism from people that you strongly disagree with. I have a subscription to The Spectator. I took it out because I got fed up of not being able to go past the paywall and so on. And I can't stand, oh, sorry, I strongly disagree with the views of Charles Moore, the former editor of The Telegraph, but I read him every week because he actually writes quite well. I read it, find it interesting, then disagree with it. But it's still good for you to do that. I read Rod Little every week because, again, he's quite an entertaining writer, even though I disagree with virtually everything he says. Change our language. You can't control what other people say, you can control what you say yourself. And everybody, whether they're pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit, does actually want the best for Britain. They're all patriots. Everybody needs to comply with the law. And also everybody is entitled to seek their political goals, but only by lawful means. And the other message to spread is a very simple one, that everybody in Britain has rights, those rights should be respected, and their presence helps us all. And these are things that even Tommy Robinson would struggle to disagree with. He, he would find, he'd try to wriggle, but it's very hard for him to, to actually directly reject some of these points. So with that, over to questions and answers.